And Sato's Place is brought to you by... He's one of the big dogs of the underdogs. You're going to learn a lot from him. We've got a brand new ITL. We're going to tell you about an incredible weekend. We're back. You're there. You're at the place. It's been Sala's Place. What's up, everybody? Great to have you back. We've, we've just had a spectacular few days. we we'll to share all that with you. Can't wait to get started on the show, Herb. What you, what you up to, my friend? Um, listen, why don't we get to it? Such good stuff going on. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, hey, guys. We're coming to you live from the Art Institute of California, Los Angeles. It's great to see you. We're coming for, to you from our beautiful HD studio, which stands for... Herb and Dave. Herb and Dave. Uh, that's all you didn't know that. Uh, likes and subscribes at all the social media spots, if you would. That keeps the show coming to you. A big key to our success and yes. hopefully something that you enjoy. Yes. Um, hello to our incredible sponsors. They were together uh, this weekend, which we'll talk about in a second. But, Dave, do you have a stump the VK guy question? I do, Herbert. What is it? When I hook up a plug-in that's... Uh multiband compressor, is it a compressor with EQ or an EQ with compression? Hmm. Hmm. I'm confused. It's bothering me. We will get that answered, and they'll I'm... be able to see that answer right below us as they watch this show. Um, to our weekend, uh, there's a million details. You've heard us talking about Gear Expo for the last probably two months, correct? Mm -hmm. Um, needless to say... Well, not me. I've been hearing you talk about it for right. a year. Needless to say, it was an incredible weekend. Um, posted at our website. You're gonna, we've cut a little sizzle reel together. It'll show you all the cool stuff. Great guests, great sponsors, great panelists, great vibe, great food. What do you think, Dave? Man, we got the greatest audience in the world. A lot of great. And they showed it this weekend. They did. They I mean, did. They, were, they were on their best behavior. All of our guests to a person complimented them and said, man... Whatever you need, whatever you need, if you can get this group of people together. And by the way, they were a little, a little better looking than the Nam crowd. <laughs> That's true. I wasn't real happy with some of the uh, hygiene in the Nam crowd. Ooh, you, you got yeah. that close to test. Yeah, yeah, but this crowd was handsome oh, okay. and, and beautiful. Great. Well, needless to Not say, not necessarily. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> Needless to say, we were inspired by the weekend. We've got more stuff in the work. So yeah. go to that video. Go to that sizzle reel. Take a look at it. Lots of stuff coming. Thanks to everybody for doing Absolutely. that. Absolutely. We've got a great guest. Let's get to him. Why don't you introduce our ITL? Well, this week's ITL, as always, I'm, I, I'm, I'm calling some stuff from recent projects that, that I've gotten compliments on, and I think you're going to enjoy this one. Let me know. I want to go back and revisit a technique I showed you into the layers. Um, the reason I'm showing it to you again is there's so many echoes and delays and echo throws and delay throws on, um, on, on a lot of the music we hear today. And, and sometimes I get frustrated because I want, I want it to be different. I want it to be unique. I want it to be new. I don't want to have the same generic stuff on every song. So I came up with this idea based on an older idea that we showed you earlier. I think you'll find this interesting. This is by Prince Board. Uh, Kat was on the show not too long ago. Very talented guy. What I've done is I took the lead vocal, which is this blue track right here, and I um, copied and pasted it down here. Now, after I copied and pasted it, I shifted it a quarter note. So this, this distance here is a quarter note. So it's a quarter note to the right. Now you'll notice that, that I've got volume rides on, on this track. So these are volume rides. So when, whenever, whenever this comes up, you'll hear, you'll hear the echo. I've got the delay a little a little louder than I normally would just so you can hear it. Eh, not, nothing special. So what I decided to do after I shifted it, and, and I rode these by hand, you can see, well, the last one I didn't, I drew the last one in. And then I had some little lower ones here just for just for effect. With these big ones, I thought were, I thought were places where it could use a little bit of lift. So I took it and I, um, I radioized it. So I'm going to play you just the delay. 
Help me! Okay, that's just the delay. Now, that was cool. Add a little isotope. Alloy 2. The preset I used, I believe, was some kind of distortion in the title. Yeah, distorted processing. <laughs> That's so cool without it. Oh, me. With it. Oh, me. Ooh, that is just neat. Okay, now that was close. I wanted more. We always want more. It's, it's America. In America, we always want more. So I took this delay and I added this delay to this already delayed track. Uh, quarter note, not. On this particular generic Pro Tools delay, this Avid delay, I'm 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 using the quarter note, but I'm using a little quicker here on the left and a little longer on the right. So now the delay itself would sound like this. <laughs> Pretty cool. Let's hear it with the track. And then, not being satisfied, this last one, I automated the feedback. So on this last one, the feedback goes crazy. Check this out, guys. Love this. Hey, <laughs> hey. Uh, who's cool? Right. Pretty neat. Okay. Now, look, you can, you can do all sorts of modifications to this technique. You can... Uh, I put a delay on it. You can... Um, you can put a reverb and then flange the reverb. Uh, you can put an auto panner, and every time the delay comes by, it'll pan. Um, you can make it just roll all the low end out and leave everything above like 5K and make it whispery. And the, the sky's the limit. And, and, and because you automated the automation on when this plays, um, you can have it wherever you want it. You can put another track below this one and let it be half notes and, and you can kind of bounce back and forth between those. Um, sky's the limit. When, when you do something cool, send it to me. I'd like to see it too. Maybe I can use it on into the lair. Okay, guys. Hasta mañana. Another great ITL, Mr. Pensado. Thank you very much. You guys make sure you use that and... Um improve those mixes and do what you need to do, correct? De nada, see. Si. Absolutely. So, what a pleasure. We're welcoming an old friend, a returning champion, one of the best in the business on a number of fronts, building business, production, developing talent. Our pleasure to welcome Harvey Mason Jr. What's up, Hi. man? Harvey. Right. Long Thank time. You so much. Right. Good to see you, my friend. Oh, good stretch. Tall people can do guess. that. Hey. <laughs> Thank you for the ITL. Now I'm, I'm really, my mixes are getting good. <laughs> Get some knowledge. I love it. Well, Absolutely. Just, just, you know, just remember, some stuff you got to leave to the professional. Yeah, I know. I, I, I'll leave that to you, but I, I'm, I'm yeah. learning. You know, you know her, her, sometimes we have guests on for our audience. This time is for me. Yeah, Harvey's absolutely. just for me. Just, just I love talking to Harvey absolutely. Mason Jr. And I, th things have changed since last time you were around this, huh? Things are always changing, and I can't remember. It's been maybe a, it's been yeah, a year? Probably. Oh, like close to two that. Two years? More than that. Yeah, it's, things have changed. Your studio looks amazing. Oh, I mean, thanks. Got like 17 cameras filming us here. <laughs> I mean, this is big time stuff. And you guys, too. You guys have yep. just, yeah. things have exploded for you, haven't you? Doing done? well, yeah, and yeah. Uh, making some good music. Yeah. And just having fun. That's why we're here. Yeah. Well, Harvey, before we get too into it, uh, let them know your website, because I was over there last night, and I was at five different websites. I can't remember. The one has got the great pictures of your facility. Your facility is like... Yeah, it's fun. Oh, you and Janine just knocked a home run with that thing. It's a good it's place. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's HarveyMasonMedia.com, okay. which is my website. Uh, UnderdogEntertainment.com, I think, is pretty stagnant. We don't really update that, but the Harvey Mason Media one gets updated. So a lot of well, good pictures. Would it be appropriate to ask what's the difference between... The two? Yeah, the, uh, my partner Damon Thomas and I had been together for 10 years and we kind of went and did our own thing for maybe three years mm -hmm. and in that period I set up Harvey Mason Media and he did his thing and then about three years ago we kind of came back and started working together so there's always underdog entertainment and then the Harvey Mason Media stuff was in the little period there in the window so. You know what, along that thread I always find that you know we get these questions asked a lot of us. Um, 
people want to partner and collaborate. And that's an art form. It is. And it has its challenges. It has its pluses and its, and its minuses. Have you learned a lot in the curve? And is there a difference between collaboration on the business side and collaboration creatively? Two separate things. Major difference, and they should be kept like that. Uh, there's a lot of partnerships that work really well creatively or in the studio or wherever your field is, and then there's other ones that work well in business, and some need to be kept separate. Yeah. And I think uh, depending on the personalities and depending on the business, I think it's a good idea to treat them as two entities, mm -hmm. which is what we've always done, and mm -hmm. it's worked well for us. But as far as being a partner with somebody, it's you have to be a collaborative personality. You have to want to take the other person's input and consider it. Yeah. And a lot of people aren't built that way, yeah. especially producers. Most yeah. producers, you know these guys mm -hmm. as well as I do, they, their mm -hmm. egos are so ridiculous yeah, right. that there's no chance they're gonna listen to somebody else when they say, oh, we should try this on the drums, or what about this for the bridge? And I guess, I don't know, I'm, I'm a different type of guy. I like that, I really enjoy it. Right. And Damon and I have had a really great creative partnership. And, in 13 years, we've never had one creative disagreement. Wow. And he'll, he'll say, amazing. hey, this song, I like it, but I think in the chorus, you need to go somewhere different in the fifth bar. I'm like, okay, let's try it. And that's right. the, the attitude, I think, wow, that works for a partnership. That is you incredible. have to Both try it. very strong-willed, very yeah. opinionated Yeah, but when producers. it comes to music, you know, there's no right way. Right. There's no solid gold answer. No textbook. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I try everything, and then ultimately we decide which way we like better, and 95% of the time we both agree, you know what, you're right, we should probably just leave it, or you're Amazing. right, it's good to change. Amazing. I want to talk to you about Pitch Perfect, but while we're on this subject, would you say it's appropriate to describe today's business model in terms of production as formalized collaborations? In other words, it seems like the produ producing world is going to camps where where you're always collaborating with with um, B team guys or D league guys, if you will, yeah. and, and it seems like it's rare that you would go to one producer anymore. That producer has collaborators that he works with, and so the whole industry has turned into collaboration, right? I think that's true, and some camps do it more collaboratively than others. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have underlings or, as you call them, B team guys mm -hmm. that do all the work. That's not collaboration. Right. That's farming that's, out that's the work while you go to the club or go to the beach. That's right. So I'm glad you what said we like that. to do is we have an A team. We don't have a B team. We don't have a D league. We have quite a few guys that we work with mm. that are always bringing new ideas, new creative directions, ways to make great records, great beats, great vocal arrangements. Anything you can think of, these guys are doing it. And we get influenced by that. Yeah. And we use that and we utilize that. And in exchange, they're also getting something that we can provide the experience and, and the things that we know and how to make records. But it's really a two-way street, the collaboration, to your point. Uh, artists are coming in and they're getting the best of everything. They're getting the newest, the freshest, the kind of the coolest material mm -hmm. they're going to get, but they're also getting really professional, well done, on time, on budget record that Absolutely. you're not going to get from a kid in the basement that has a, a laptop. You that's, know, right. that's, that's the difference. So. To your question, there are a lot of people doing that, a lot of camps, a lot of people collaborating, but the way we do it is we only keep great guys around us, guys mm -hmm. that can make great records, mm -hmm. guys that do things that we don't necessarily always do. We don't have 10 guys that are all underling, un underdog juniors. You exactly. know? We have guys, this guy's doing this crazy new sound, he's doing this, and we're like, man, that's so cool, let's integrate that into what we do. So that's how we like no to do it. Nothing leaves the building without your stamp of approval, your taste, and your sensibilities imprinted on it, right? No, nothing leaves any part of the building. I don't <laughs> like to not touch any part of it. And mm -hmm. maybe I'm too controlling, but I really feel the difference between what the underdogs do and what other companies do is there's not that same quality consistency. Absolutely. Every record that comes out of our facility, we want it to sound better than everyone else. We want the drum programming to be better. We want the melodies to be stronger. We want the lyrics to be just as hooky as any record you've ever heard. And for that to happen, I don't really rely on, you know, I don't trust too many people to make that happen. It's myself and Damon, mm -hmm. uh, and as I said, we have great guys working with us, but I want to be sure that I'm involved in every record all the way through. And I've been through camps that that's not how it is. I mm -hmm. came up in different camps, and uh, as you said, you know, guys are bringing in B teams, and that doesn't excite me. I do music because I love doing it. I want it to be great. I want to hear it mm -hmm. on the radio. I want to see it places, and I, when I retire, I want it to keep playing. And, and you know what else I think is interesting as a metaphor, because you're an athlete, and it was almost a pro athlete as a basketball player. Um, I remember watching, and you know, I'm, my father was a professional athlete. 
you you're inspired. You play your best game when you're playing against the best competition and mm -hmm. when you're around the best players. I remember seeing Magic Johnson being interviewed right after his, his equity stake in the Dodgers. And he said, if you don't really know, I'm a control freak. Right. And he said, you know, so when you see him running the break, that's Magic's break. Everybody yeah, else yeah. fills in yeah. and does what he does. And and so we do this Great. with Pensado. Yeah. Like there's a brand. If it doesn't hit the brand, mm -hmm. I kill it. If it yeah. doesn't touch you and Damon, right. you kill it. You raise your bar. You don't lower your bar. Right. Well, to that, that's why we have great guys around us too. Absolutely. Like Magic had Kareem and James Worthy and Norm Nixon. Right. That's right. You know, we have our guys too. <laughs> Absolutely. You wouldn't be the underdogs if you don't have the greatest engineer in the world, which that's I right. think we have, the greatest writers and producers. So yep. we, it's it's uh, it's an amazing team. Yeah. I love going to work every day. Yeah, it's great. That's I'm great. I'm jealous. Uh, I, I, sometimes I, I wonder if I did the right thing being a mixer because that sounds like so much fun to me. You do it okay. My problem was I could write, but nobody liked it. <laughs> that's what I'm Perfect. Pitch perfect, man. You, you, that had to catch you off guard, didn't it? Did, well, it did. Expecting? Yeah, it totally caught me off guard. And maybe for some of your viewers who aren't as familiar, it was a small movie. Uh, a, actually, a music supervisor brought it to my attention. Hey, we're doing this, this little movie. It's an acapella movie about singing groups. And they knew I was kind of a vocal, uh, you know, a snob, I guess, or mm -hmm. a, a vocal nerd. I love, love producing that. vocals. I really get into cutting vocals. So... He said, I think you might be a great person for this project. And I said, yeah, we'll do it for fun. We had done Dream Girls and we had done some other, you know, good music-based films. And this seemed like kind of the next step in that progression. And he gave me the rundown, showed me some of the music. I said, let's do it. And it turned out, as we talked about, the soundtrack is like platinum and the wow. movies everywhere. And Congrats. for me, it was really cool because it's a it's a movie about music. Yeah, exactly. And you don't get a chance to do that that often. Yep. So yep. I loved it. it oh, was congrats! Great. And now they're going to make another one. Oh, cool. Yeah. Even better. Uh, yeah. Even better. I mean, there's been so many movies where, like, like, like Drumline, where you got competing drum core and you got. Um, what was what was the Shabba do when the I think Ice T was in it, competing oh God, dance yeah. troops? Oh and so yeah, yeah. When I saw yeah. when I saw competing acapellas, acapella I'm like, somebody has. I mean, I, I'm thinking like Sharknado here, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and and it's great. It's good. It's yeah. really it's really good, and, and it's good because of the music. That's what gives it the credibility. Right. The soundtrack is. Yeah, it's gone. Yeah, it was number one on iTunes for at, a long time. At a time when soundtracks don't go. They don't go. Well, and nothing goes. Exactly. <laughs> nothing <laughs> sells a main record. So precisely. And that's kind of why I was excited, because it's a chance to, it was a study in great music, because exactly. every one of the songs on that soundtrack was a hit record. Exactly. So for us to be able to dissect that and put it back together in acapella format, it was like, oh, that was really cool to see how that song was a hit. You know, a Katy Perry yeah. song or yeah. a, a Blackstreet record. and, and turn it into an acapella song. It was cool. I had oh, a great time. Amazing. Really amazing. fun. And on a similar note, you know, last year we did X Factor, the TV yep. show, yep. which was another really interesting study in hit record making because every week we had to produce a song for L.A. Reid's contestants. Turnovers and fast, you're, right? You're doing you know, two, three songs a week, yeah. and each one of them was a number one record. Wow. And so in recreating these songs and producing them for the different artists, you're kind of dissecting it and you're seeing what made these songs so successful and such big hit records. So it's it's great training and, and I've encouraged a lot of young producers, not on X Factor, but just on their own time to go through and study music, be a mm -hmm. fan, learn why did that record work? What's the formula if there is such a thing? What is some of, what are some of the tricks that make a record a hit record? Yep. And yep. that's one of the ways that uh, you know, I think we're still improving in making music. Because, because you're such an astute observer of the business, I, I think we're all now making things. We're all in the content business. Mm -hmm. And you have to look at it as content. So from your perspective at such an elite level, which, which will actually apply to our audience, when you do X Factor or when you do Pitch Perfect or when you're asked to do those other things, doesn't it inform your record making and producing skills in other ways as well too? Preparing for other content. I mean, at the at the foundation, has to be great songs. Yeah. And without that, nothing else matters. But you're now preparing for other formats, having to cut with different speeds. Is, Absolutely. Does that change your skills? I think it enhances your skills. I and agree. I think if you don't have those skills to begin with, you're not going to be able to do those projects. Yeah. I think that's one reason that LA tapped us to do what he needed. You know, that you're doing a pop record one week, you're doing an R&B record the next week. Exactly. So I think it does enhance your skills, but I also think you need to make sure you're at that point before you can take those type of things on. Yeah. Coming up as a young producer, I started a jingle company. So right. I did jingles every week, 30 that's seconds hard. of music, 60 second music, and I was doing one or two of those a week. Whoa. And a 
break store doesn't necessarily want an R&B song. They might want a rock song. Right. Or they might want a country song. So right. you have to be able to be well-rounded enough to do that. And to your point, that's something that I think enhanced my skill as a producer, how mm -hmm. to make those things on time, quickly, tell a story in 60 seconds, work with all the demo singers, make it sound like the radio. Yep. Those are all little miniature tests that you're going through yeah. every week that yeah. I found to be really helpful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Harvey, do you see, I'm trying to learn from this question, do you see writing and producing as two separate tasks or have they become one task for you? In other words, I, I understand your question. I think there's two answers to that. My personal answer is that they're very separate tasks. Oh, they are? Yes, because there's people that are great writers that are horrible producers. And mm -hmm. I think in the industry today, everyone thinks if you're a writer, you're a producer, or you're a producer, you're a writer. And I totally disagree with that. Mm -hmm. There's guys that can play some amazing chords, or there's guys that can write great top line, or even program a, an incredible beat. But that doesn't make you a producer. Absolutely. That makes you a nice writer. That's okay? right. You get some publishing for that. Right. Don't come over here trying to produce the record. Right. Or vice versa. Just because you're producing someone else's creation, don't say, hey, I want publishing. I deserve publishing. You didn't do it. You didn't write it. That's right. You polished it. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's two different tasks. I think if you can do both of them, it's really helpful. And I think that's what we try and do. We mm -hmm. try and be great writers. We try and be great producers. They're two skill sets. Mm -hmm. um, the reason I ask that question is because for you and Damon, they seem so completely and thoroughly integrated. I can't separate them with you guys like I can with some people. So it's yeah. interesting you say yeah. you answered it that way because of, of all the people I know, you do that better than anybody, but yet you think of them as separate. Yeah, I, I think we treat them as separate because we spend a lot of time trying to write great songs. Right. And then we figure out how we're going to produce them mm -hmm. to sound like relevant contemporary records. And I think if you try and just do it all at the same time, you end up making this very disposable, trendy music because you're more worried about making it cool before you're worrying about making a great song. Yep. I yep. asked Ron Fair this question, and I can't wait to hear your answer. Do melodies go out of, sky, out of style? Or do melodies follow trends? Well, my answer will be based off of Ron Fair's answer. So what did he say? <laughs> <laughs> he said absolutely. He said check with Harvey. they go out of style? <laughs> yeah. He said that melodies, a melody that could have worked in the early 90s probably wouldn't work now. Um, well, Ron's a lot smarter than I am, so I think he's probably right. But I will say there are classic melodies and things that you hear. You guys know them as well mm -hmm. as I do. There are songs from... The 70s and 80s, you hear that melody right now, and like that's a Bang. hit record. Absolutely. And you'll be singing it until you're 75 years old. So yep. I think there are small, small details that change in, a, in everything, in music, in mm -hmm. drum program. You know, there's a drum beat that Timberland did in the 80s or early 90s that's not going to sound cool now. And the same goes for melodies. There's little small intricacies that you can do on the tail end of the notes or scoops into the beginning of notes or the way we stack backgrounds that make melodies appealing for today Yeah. Uh, that definitely will go out of style soon. Right, right. But I, I don't think... I don't think, if you have a classic melody, I think it'll always work. No doubt. How about that? No doubt about it. You can style it differently, yeah. but it's always going to work. For mm -hmm. me, for me, and this show's about you, I apologize, but for me, <laughs> the way I, where I noticed it the most was in, um, it seemed like half notes and whole notes were like the norm years back, and now, like after Sean Garrett, we like quick little rappy, yeah. choppy notes, and then Esther Dean kind of made that, temp. seemed like the, 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 the tempo of, the, not the tempo, but the... Uh, the rhythm of the melody changed more than the the movement of the notes. But are you considering all those songs as classic copyright records? That would be my question. And I'm not downplaying anything right. that mm -hmm. anyone does because they're amazing hit records. And those mm -hmm. guys, Sean Garrett, the people you mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. you know, all those people, Esther, Esther incredible. I've mm -hmm. done records with them, and I'm, I think they're amazing. But if you're comparing that to the records from the 70s or 60s or 50s or Terrible 80s world. that are Mel classic melodies that will be around for 100 years, then I think you need to compare those. Find the songs in the last five years that have classic melodies and say, would that have worked in the 70s? Yeah, you can have apples to apples. apples, to apples. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, and also, then when you go to all the fantastic writers in other genres, right? you know, country, country and rock. What about a Diane Warren song? Yeah, Those precisely. melodies are pretty... Pretty sound, a little similar to the melodies from the 90s, 80s, uh, 70s. Yeah, Babyface. Babyface. You know, you know, classic <laughs> rock writer. I mean, yeah. there's just so many things. It might just be pop, kind of pop R&B stuff. Yeah. Katy yeah. Perry melodies don't sound, or Kesha melodies don't sound like anything we've heard yeah. before. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. When, when you, we were talking earlier about sources of inspiration, <clears throat> where do you go for inspiration when you 
feel like you need some rejuvenation in your creativity? I listen to a lot of other genres of music, yeah. and I get a lot of inspiration from other producers. I get you know things from young, up and coming. I listen to some hip hop records, and mm -hmm. what they're doing with their rhythms is so incredible. And I listen to EDM music and what they're doing with their programming and production yep. and editing, and you know the trickery that they're using. I get inspiration from that. Uh, I just get inspiration from other sources of music, mm -hmm. and then. Conceptually and like lyrically, I get inspiration from daily life and just things that I'm yeah. going through, yeah. books that I'm reading, a movie that I'm watching, mm -hmm. somebody that I talk to in the lounge at the studio. Mm -hmm. and, and I try and, the music we make, we try and make it specific to artists. So we'll really spend time with the artists and I'll get a lot of inspiration or, or motivation from the mm -hmm. artists themselves. They'll tell me what they're going through or the, what, what's on their mind and I try and, try and dig from that. Do you, I, I preach this to our audience when we talk to them and we see them on the show to just consume, yeah. to, to step outside your box, to yeah. input differently. It's gonna inform your creative process. You agree with that? Totally, and no, not enough people do it. And uh, I, I think talk, it's critical. It's horrible. Yeah. I talk to people, they don't know who certain artists are. I said, if you're gonna be a songwriter or a producer or an artist, know the history yeah. and consume it, like yep. you said, yep. devour it. You know, I, I was a very, I listened to music nonstop mm -hmm. as a kid and, mm -hmm. and even up until in the last few years, I continually listen to music. And just a quick story, I worked on Michael Jackson's last record and Michael had a guy that worked for him that brought him all the Billboard charts on a cassette, which is kind of weird, but mm -hmm. on a cassette every week. Mm -hmm. So he would listen to every song on every chart every week. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when I saw that, I was every like- Every chart? Yeah, oh, country, rock, pop, adult content. You know, right. He listened to all of them. He would have a like a case with the cassettes in mm -hmm. it and he would listen to every week and when I saw that I said that's that's smart and a friend of yours continues to do that today that we all know and everybody knows is revered to this day it's probably in his 70s you know who else does that mm. Clive Davis oh yeah yeah he has staffers bring him all the records on the top 10 records of every chart in order for it to stay current listens every single week it, and Clive will play it for you and you walk in his office that's right he'll let you know because <laughs> I will be in there for four hours and you're going to sit through every one of them that's way. right that's now right. why does your snare drum not sound like exactly this? Clive exactly. Is smart he is it's ridiculous he's smart as a whip yeah absolutely you mentioned a minute ago about inspiration from the artists themselves is your first choice to, to write with an artist and, and create with them or have them come by and listen to things you've already written and, and, and my kind first of choice out? my first choice is to get all the information from the artist spend time with them maybe a whole day maybe two days and then have them go away <laughs> and oh, that's uh -huh. my favorite thing uh -huh. if they're sitting there looking over your shoulder and unless they're a really good writer and adept at, like we talked about collaborating, it's sometimes a hindrance to having them there because yeah. they don't know when to talk, they don't know when to interject their opinions. So for me, I like to get the information from them, let them go out to eat and hang out and have fun, come back and see what we've put together for them. Got it, got it. Have you ever noticed a trend or a thread in your biggest songs? Do they tend to start with music first, with drums first, with lyrics and melodies first. On just your biggest songs, is, have you noticed a, a, a pattern? pattern? For us, most of our songs start with chords. And I don't know if that's really? weird or not. Piano, but, guitar, piano what, chords. Got it. Yeah. That's yeah. not weird. Some of our songs start with a concept, but I'd say 5% of the time. Wow. It's usually chords. Damon plays piano. I play piano, he plays better than I do, but we both play piano, mm -hmm. and we'll be sitting around playing chords, and all of our tracks start with chords, and then we'll add drums, and then uh. we'll start thinking of concepts, or maybe we have a concept that we've gotten from a, 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 an artist, and mm -hmm. we'll kind of have it in mind, but we're always starting on the piano. Uh, uh. I notice when I play chords on a guitar, things are different than when I play them on a piano. Have you know, do you use only piano for the chords? No, we, we have a couple guys that play guitar. I don't personally play guitar, uh. but... I think the songs that come from guitar are definitely different songs than yeah. the songs you write on a piano. And, and those chords, I mean, there's the classic chord change, you know, chords patterns. Do you, do you, where do you get those chord inspirations from? Same thing, other types of music. You know, we pull weird chords from a Broadway musical, a yeah. end of a soundtrack, a movie score, mm -hmm. just places we hear things. And Damon's really good at that. He'll hear something and he'll come to studio or he'll call me, Harvey, you gotta listen to this cue at the end of the TV show that I watched. Mm. I was like, what are you talking about? Mm. But he'll remember it and it'll strike a chord with him and then wow. he'll use that in, in a song. Have, have you ever heard that comedian that, that sings eight million different hit songs over the same chord? Oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That it's comedian, crazy, you heard that, right? Yeah, it's crazy. creepy. It's crazy. That, you know, the, the future, as Dave prepares Batter's Box, the future of, 
you know, what are you guys working on? What's the future for Underdog and Harvey Mason Media? Because I think just as, just as a testament to a friend, one of the things I love to see is the balance between the creative and the business side. Some people get one right, not the other, and then, yeah. it, and then it implodes the other thing. So I love that you guys focus on both things. And make we, it try. we try. We yeah. try to focus. And it's hard. And yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. Hard. It's yeah. hard. Um, and I usually try and split my day up where I'm spending half the day doing business and yep. trying to grow the company, and the other half really creating the content. But mm -hmm. uh, for the future, and this is just a, as of late, we've gotten into overseeing album projects, which mm. for me is an exciting opportunity just to, to be able to influence not just one or two songs yeah. and have a single or here or there, but really get back to making great albums. And I know that's a little antiquated because people want to download one song here, one song there. But for me, as an art form, making an album is really cool. Mm -hmm. You know, getting to do five or eight or ten songs that sound similar yeah. or have a, a common thread or have a concept behind them is exciting. So we're doing a lot more of that. We're actually kind of doing four or five albums right now where mm -hmm. we'll write three or four songs, but then we'll oversee the whole album. So mm -hmm. that's something that I want to continue to do in the future, developing more artists mm -hmm. you know, and having a hand in really breaking a, a new artist from scratch and really establishing a sound for that artist is something I really want to continue. Who, to who are you working on that's, that excites you? Yeah. Um, you know, we just finished a record with TGT, which is... Tank, Tyrese, and Genuine, oh, cool. kind of a lot R and B super group. Oh, wow. so yeah, yeah. We just kind of oversaw the you know, album, produced that whole album, and finished it two nights ago. So nice. I'm excited about you know always excited about the last sure. thing you do. So sure. I'm excited sure. about that. Some really good R and B music, which mm -hmm. I think we need. You mm -hmm. know, um, Tamar Braxton, which is another great artist, which we, we've done a, some great songs with. It's one of those is coming out in two weeks, so mm -hmm. that's exciting. The American Idol girl, Candace Glover, mm. we, we've kind of done a deal to help oversee that album. Mm -hmm. um, a couple other. Chris Brown's new stuff too? Yep. Oh, yep. cool. Always, always cool, one cool, of my cool. favorite artists. The other part that we have focused on, and we know you are too, is the, just the international community and yeah. the music that's from around the world. Ooh, that's, that's, that's exciting. That's right? a whole big answer. <laughs> that's a whole nother show. No, no, I'm that's just saying, yeah, yeah, I'm just yeah, saying that people should think about that. He just got back from Korea. Right, and yeah. people should think about that as, as possibilities. Well, the American brand is so strong around the world as far as our music is concerned. They love our pop music. They love our R&B exactly. music. And, and the opportunity is there for so many young writers and producers to, to take advantage of that in other countries. So for us, we just did a deal with a company in Korea. They have 20, 30 artists artists over there and they're wow. selling millions of records because they control Korea, China, and Japan. And they put an artist out in all three territories. So it's a huge opportunity. Uh, so we'll be doing a lot of music for a company and over you know, there. The other thing too is the demand for mixing all that stuff. It's the, all the, same. the demand for mixing a lot of that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Just call me. There you go. <laughs> Just call me. Well, you know, I tell you something about Batter's Box coming up. Tee it up. It's one of the first. Ooh, nice it, it could be the first Probably. Batter's Box where I wasn't limited by questions for a producer or an engineer or a songwriter. Fire away. So he's going to be the first one. He's going to get them all. And I'm saying that because he's a good engineer. He pioneered <laughs> no, Pro no. Tools very How quietly. <laughs> very quietly. He was using Pro Tools back when it was a two-track. What year was that, Harvey? 92? 92, yeah. 92. You're yeah. showing my age, Dave. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mind. could tell you guys a lot of good stories about Pro Tools. I won't bore you with them now, but Hello. when we first started doing Pro Tools with with artists, they were freaking out. Yeah, me too. They were like, well, I, I need what the rewind this? time. Yep. I can't, you know, there's a lot of weird stuff. I had an A&R guy make me take it out of the room just in case I was using it secretly. <laughs> uh, I love it. Uh, we'll talk about that another that's time. That's some NSA stuff. Yeah. Far away, man. All right, my friend. You, you, you. Hold on, hold on. What a batter's box? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, let me get ready for this. <laughs> you know my memory's not good because I know you're going to ask me some detailed questions. And just, just say dumbass questions. All right, next. here we go. S subtract points from them, Herb. But you're an athlete. You should, you should be good. All right. Lead vocals. Lead vocals, the most important part of a record to me. A lot of people think it's drums and low end. Lead vocals so important. Uh, my vocal chain has been the same for 10 years. I probably shouldn't admit that, but I use a Sony microphone, uh, the Summit Audio compressor, and an Avalon preamp. Secret is out. I've always used it. It's well, clean, I'm it's simple, it doesn't color the sound, and you could probably tell me better than I would know myself, but I think that chain is pretty transparent, so you can really cover a lot of different singers well, with Well, I admire that answer. I just want one word. Neve. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I know you want, you want a Neve in there somewhere. Uh. <laughs> Piano, uh, my favorite. I got two things I'll say about the word piano. I have a great Yamaha seven foot studio grand. It's incredible that we use a lot. A lot of great records were written and produced on that. But I have a new plugin that I love, which is called um, 
shoot, now I can't remember what it's called, but it's an amazing piano. Mm. Uh, a virtual piano? Play? Virtual piano, yeah. And Not I have, Alicia Keys one. No, I have that one. That one's really good, too. Um, but these guys, they have a new if piano. If you think it's, of it in a minute, yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll I know come I got, to me in a minute. I got you under pressure now because you're on the ropes because you're losing, my friend. I am getting killed yeah. here. Bass. Bass. Trilogy. I use tr Ooh. Trilogy a ton. I uh, use a plug-in on my bass, usually 50% of the time, called Sausage Fattener, oh, which is probably a really Dada Life. grimy, nice. grimy plug-in. We gotta get Dada like. Life on the show. Yeah, that, that's a good plug-in. I've spoken to them. I love those guys. Drums, drums, kick, snare. It's all about the kick and snare. I use a lot of um, a lot of compression, kick and snare, both. I still like the SSL stuff that, that I use out of Pro Tools, stereo bus compressor that I'll put on my drums a lot. Um, it's a little sausage fattener from time to time. I love um, the CLA stuff. I use those on drums from time to time. Um, but it's all about really trying to get the drums to pump and push really, really hard. The kick's got to move a ton of air. We're still using a lot of 808 stuff. Oh, so nice. that low end, you got to be careful with it, and you have to deal with it mm -hmm. probably a lot. But mm -hmm. finding the balance between the drums and your last question was the bass. So it's trying like to cornflakes and milk. It's got to balance out. Yeah, sometimes we get it, sometimes we fail. Oh, I get it all the time. Backs. <laughs> Backs. Uh, a little bit of an underdog trademark, I would say. We, we take a lot of time and pride in our background arrangements. Uh, probably go overboard sometimes, but we love backgrounds. We stack in groups of fours, traditionally, four parts at least, always a lot of counter melodies, mm. uh, a lot of high octave stuff on the most important lyrics in the hook. So all little tricks that we do, but mm. um, we really like backs. Nice. I'm a slide engineer, reverb. Reverb, I'm a kind of an old school reverb guy. I've been using the Lexicon 480L plug-in, oh. so I like that a lot. Well, that's new school. Plug yeah, I guess it is. It's plug-in at least. Uh, yeah, yeah. But then I also like the just the Pro Tools reverb for certain things. Uh, and then I've been using a couple of reverbs out of Logic. One's called Space Designer, which is really cool and I think sounds great. Mm. For me, reverbs are all about the tail and how it tails yeah. out. And a lot of the digital stuff sounds a little bit crappy to me in the way at the end of the reverb. I like that reverb to tail out clean. Mm. And that's kind of how I base my selection on reverbs, how it tails out. Mm. Synth strings. Synth strings. Atmosphere still has the best synth strings to me as far as a synth string. There's other plugins that have the real acoustic London string, the philharmonic sounding strings uh, that we we'll use out of contact from time to time. But Atmosphere, Hollywood strings, those are the type of patches that we use a lot. Uh, and I use synth strings a lot. I'm a sucker for synth strings. You know what? Me too. <laughs> I love synth strings. They're Crank easier em. to mix. Okay, last one. Your island microphone. If you're on an island, what micro one microphone would you have with you? A Sony 800G. No brainer. It's my one oh. microphone. I well, should say something really cool like the 251 Telefunken uh, or something. No, the 800G is an incredible mic. It's my favorite mic. I take it with me when I travel. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're doing vocals when you travel. That'd be yeah. kind of creepy if, yeah. if you didn't. <laughs> yeah. well, How'd you do, Herb? Uh, what I loved about this particular Robin Batters box is that you got the ball arcing toward the thing, but you got all this information going with it. So it was more than just one word, it was context. Let me remind you yes. of our relationship and the closeness thereof. Okay. And the, and the <laughs> business relationship that we have. Yes. Not, just, not just best friends. Okay. So I'm 0 for a 200 on Stump VK. I'm 0 Close. for 200 on Batter's Box. When the hell am I gonna win one? You've You're the won, judge. You won a few Batter's Boxes, but we would never embarrass our audience. And that was about a year. You're about a year from a win. They get embarrassed just coming on talking to me. This would be a step up embarrassment. Well, as of today and being topical, <laughs> you lost. <laughs> <laughs> Let's introduce Chongor over there in our corner office. Chong, hit us with a couple quick questions for Harvey. He's got a busy schedule. We're gonna get him out of here. This one's from TechRef. What instruments take you the most time to simulate in the box, and do you ever bring in session players? Oh, great question. Good question. question. Yeah. yeah, you can't simulate a guitar player to me. Yes. Just, <laughs> as a guitar player? Yeah. We spend a lot of time, actually I don't spend a lot of time trying to simulate guitars because I just bring somebody in, but we spend a lot of time in other areas trying to come up with really cool sounds, but a guitar is just one you can't do. That's right. And I have a couple guys, one in particular that works with me, Andrew Hay, he's mm -hmm. an amazing player, mm -hmm. great sounds, and if I need a guitar, it's you just call. sitting next to me. So. Absolutely. I, I, I'm gonna stop you real quick. I, I'm a guitar player. I eat, sleep, drink, guitar. I love guitar. My mom taught guitar. 
but every once in a while when I hear a synth guitar done really right, it just I just love it. Yeah. Because you hear you you never hear them done right. But when you do hear a good yeah. sample, a, the the reason people go wrong with synth guitars is they try to emulate a real guitar. Let the synth be proud to be a synth. I agree with that. Don't even worry about what it sounds like vis-a-vis -a, -vis a real guitar, and you'll make some great sounds. Mm. I've heard you do it. Yeah, we've used weird sounds, but I'm not trying to be a guitar with that. Right. I just like the texture of it. But I like that. It. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll vote for that. Yeah. I'll vote for that. This cool. next one's from uh, Greg. Chong. This next one's from uh, Greg Swanson. From your experience, what separates the successful and unsuccessful producer slash songwriters? Ooh, that's hard. Obviously, first of all, talent. Mm -hmm. uh, but beyond that, it's persistence and hard work, and I think that goes a little bit to my background, my athletic background. I will not stop until I feel I've beaten everybody else. Absolutely. You know, it's a competitive world. World domination. And I think dude. it's a, a matter of, of course, having the talent and knowing what you're doing, how to make music, but you got to work. You have to work. And I see so many young guys coming up. They want instant success. They want to write one track a week. They want to write one song here or there, have fun and relax. It's about work Absolutely. and getting in the studio and being dedicated to being great, not dedicated to buying a necklace or a car, dedicated to making real good music, better than what you hear on the radio, and that's to me what determines success from average or failure. Harvey, from the time you thought, you know what, I can do this, to the time that you thought, wow, I am I'm good. I'm doing it. How, how, <laughs> what was that length of time? Uh, I, I don't know, I think it still is going on. I still think, <laughs> I say to myself, I think I can do this, I think I can be great. Yeah. Uh, but realistically, it took me five years of like hustling, driving out to LA. I mean, everybody has the same story, sleeping in their cars, running around with cassettes, trying to meet A&R guys. And I met one early in my five-year window there who said, hey, Harvey, you've got to listen to the radio and compare your music to what's working. Mm -hmm. And until you're at that level or beating that, don't come back to my office. Wow. And so I, I studied a lot. And so it took me about five years to get my music to the point where I thought it was good, and then people started hiring me. Wow. They, uh, our audience has heard from one of the greats. There's Absolutely. no... Absolutely. Plus, Harvey's, Harvey's his, he's just inspirational on so many levels, you know? Yep. Oh, I think we all guys. have athletic backgrounds, and I, I like it. I liked it when Chris Lord Algae said that it's okay to be competitive in a healthy way. I like competition Absolutely. in our world, but healthy, like... Absolutely. Like if you and I went to play pool, we both want to win. <laughs> but I don't want to. I don't want to catch you with a pool cue. Well, part of part of what Harvey represents and, and Underdog has represented for a long time is integrity. Mm -hmm. So you'd add that competitive level of an athlete and the integrity and the, and the and the and the standard being so high, you just end up with greatness. So it's an object lesson for our audience, man. Thank you very much. It was great Good to be here. Congrats patience, on the show. Patience, this man. place is amazing. We uh, at and some I point, want to come to the Gear Fest. I, so, I hear all these cool people. I'm like, hey, where was I at the Gear Fest? I want to. I love. I'm a gear nerd. <laughs> so let's do two things. One is you are on for the next one, which is being planned. Okay. And we'd love at some point in time to come on location and shoot at your place. Please. So we'll set when? that up. I'll, I'll call I don't need a date. He Let's already, he and I already date. discussed that. Oh, cool. That. Done, but, done. But we got to get a couple of ducks in a row first. All I can't right. go there unprepared. Oh, no, and, and we will. We'll come we up. Ne You'll we never to. go anyplace unprepared. Well, I do. But You'll love it. I don't. Not <laughs> representing the show. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Wrap us up and take us home, bro. <laughs> okay, guys, I want to leave you this one thought. Every week I get to sit across from incredible people like Harvey, and every week I learn new stuff. If I was hanging out with him in a restaurant, I couldn't ask him these questions, but I get to ask him on the show. So <laughs> you're the beneficiary of that. So make good use of it. Light up his Facebook page. Let him know you enjoyed it. And we'll see you next week.